Hi, everyone. Welcome to Muslim Women Creating New Futures, the Campaign for Justice in Muslim Family Laws. My name is Salome Gomez Upegi. I'm a writer, women's leadership consultant, and LLM graduate from Harvard. And I'm delighted to be here today as your moderator. This webinar is hosted by the Program on Law and Society in the Muslim World, co-sponsored by the Human Rights Program at Harvard Law School, HLS Advocates for Human Rights, and Musawa. This is also one of many exciting events going on this week as part of Worldwide Week at Harvard. Thank you to everyone who is joining us from the Harvard community as well as participants from all across the world. Just a bit of housekeeping before we begin the seminar. First, please know that our audience will be muted throughout the webinar. The Zoom webinar will be recorded and made available afterwards on social media platforms of the Program on Law and Society in the Muslim World and Musawa. We plan to have a main 60 minute session followed by a 25 minute Q&A and you may enter your questions at any time during the webinar in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll try to get to as many of them as we can during the discussion. We're very excited to welcome our guest speakers. Zaina Anwar co-founded two groundbreaking women's rights groups that engage with Islam from a rights perspective to promote the rights of women living in Muslim contexts. She is a founding member and the executive director of Musawa, a global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family. She was a founding member and former executive director of Sisters in Islam, a Malaysian NGO working on women's rights within an Islamic framework. Marwa Sharafeldin is a women's rights activist based in Cairo, Egypt. She is the MENA region senior expert at Musawa and a co-founder of the network of women's rights organizations in Egypt. She has been involved in activist work on women's rights with numerous NGOs in Egypt. Marwa has served as a board member in Musawa and as an advisor for the Global Fund for Women and the Asian Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women, ARO. Last but not least, Hala al Karib is an activist and social and gender research practitioner from Sudan. She is the regional director of the Strategic Initiative for Women in the Horn of Africa and the editorial head of the annual journal Women in Islam. Hala's activism specifically focuses on women and girls' rights, refugees, displaced persons, and the challenges faced by minority communities. So we'll start by speaking with Zaina. Hi, Zaina. Hi. Could you tell? Thanks for being here. We're very excited to, to hear your intervention. Intervention. So could you start off by telling us a bit more about Musawa's work and the global campaign for justice in the Muslim family laws? Thank you so much, Salome. Hello, everybody in different parts of the world and the Harvard community. And I really must thank um, Salma Wahidi as well and the team at the Program on Law and Society in the Muslim World for this incredible opportunity for us in Musawa to share this really very new and very exciting um, campaign that we have just launched on Muslim family law reform. Um, for the past 10 years, um, Salome Musawa, through our key areas of work in knowledge building, capacity building, and international advocacy, has built a strong foundation, both in scholarship and activism, to make the case for the necessity and possibility of reform towards equality and justice for women living in Muslim contexts. As we enter the next decade of our growth, we are focused now on amplifying our voice and accelerating our impact on the ground through the launch of our, of our campaign for justice in Muslim family laws. This is, a, this is the 21st century and we're telling our governments and the international and regional human rights systems that we will no longer accept the ways Muslim leaders and non-state actors use and abuse Islam to justify discrimination against women, not least in the family. While many discriminatory family laws throughout the world have undergone reform to recognize equality and non-discrimination, it is really unfortunate that Muslim family laws until today continue to govern the lives of Muslim women 
through a legal framework that regards the man as the provider and protector. You can see that um, 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 picture by a Tunisian artist that we love to use to illustrate male authority over women. Yeah, th through a legal, it is, you know, the governing the lives of women through a legal framework that regards, women, that regards the man as the provider and the protector and the woman as the obedient, subservient wife and caregiver, and of course, silent and silenced, ideally. And this privilege and authority given to men in the Muslim legal tradition is reflected in discriminatory legal provisions and practices that until today allows for practices such as child marriage, polygamy, marital rape, wife beating, mothers that mothers have no right to guardianship of their children, women cannot leave home or work without the permission of their husband. Musawa has identified through our work in the past 10 years, we have identified 12 key areas of discrimination against women in Muslim family laws, in, prov in provisions on entering marriage, during marriage and after marriage, as um, the slide there shows you. Yeah, these include issues such as age of marriage, women's consent and capacity to marriage, polygamy, divorce rights, financial rights after divorce, custody and guardianship of children, wife beating, inheritance rights, it goes on. Today, we are demanding an end to these discriminations. The world has changed, women's realities have changed, women today are providers and protectors of their families as well. The law must change to recognize these changing realities. This discontinued disconnect between law and reality is causing harm to the well being of marriage and family, not least to women and children. It is therefore really not a surprise then that we find so many Muslim countries, including high and middle income Muslim countries, at the bottom of various gender equality surveys. For example, the World Economic Forum Gender Gap Survey, the World Bank Women Law and Business Survey. In fact, 20 to 21 countries at the bottom of these two surveys are Muslim majority countries. And cross-country global research using this data show that without equality in the private sphere of the family, there can be no equality for women in the public sphere and it identified family law reform as the most critical area of legal framework that needs to change to accelerate gender equality for women. It is for all these reasons that Musawa has launched the Campaign for Justice in Muslim Family Laws. For the past one year, Musawa has been pre preparing several resources to make the case for reform. We have prepared tables for 33 countries and we're building more tables, tracking their Muslim family laws, analyzing the areas of discrimination and also good practices. We develop a positive development table to show that in many Muslim countries, family law, law reform has indeed taken place to recognize equality and non-discrimination. This really helps to break the myth that fam Muslim family law is divine law that cannot be changed. The fact is, it has changed over the decades and continues to change with much difficulty, of course, but there is a trajectory. We are developing policy briefs to support reform on contentious issues, such as on the minimum age of marriage, on polygamy, on equal right to divorce, on financial rights upon divorce, custody and guardianship of children, and we are redefining marriage as a partnership of equals. We're building the movement for reform. Brave women and men, activists, academics, and even some policy makers who believe the time has come for change are joining hands to build a global momentum, build support for the urgent necessity of reform of discriminatory Muslim family laws. We're developing new feminist knowledge, new jurisprudence, new ethics in Muslim marriages. We're reclaiming justice and ihsan, beauty, goodness, care, as the basis of marriage, not male authority and dominance over women. 
We hope that many of you who are now listening to this webinar and are working or interested in working on issues of justice and equality for women living in Muslim contexts, and in particular, those interested in family law reform will join hands with us to build this campaign for justice in Muslim family laws. Do visit our website. We've got tons of materials that I've mentioned and really, you know, come and be a part of this campaign. And of course, Salma and her team have in the legal clinic, human rights legal clinic in Salome, you've been a part of that team too, have been helping us for the past two years, actually developing those um, country tables on Muslim family law. So thank you so much to the law school, to the legal clinic, to Salma and um, the students for being a part of this campaign already before it became a campaign, yeah, when we were building the resources. Thank you so much, Zaina, for that incredibly inspiring introduction and for the incredibly important work that you're doing. We'd like to learn a little bit more about your work in the region, and it would be great to hear about the demands for reform led by Muslim women within communities. And it would be great if you could also share a bit about the issues affecting Muslim women and the impacts of colonial legacy laws like family laws, specifically in South and Southeast Asia. Yeah, thank you for this opportunity to speak about the particularities of Muslim family laws in my part of the world. Of course, Musawa works um, at the global level. So we work um, in the MENA region, we work in Sub-Saharan Africa, and we of course work in South Asia and Southeast Asia. And I really want to start by making the point that actually, you know, many people in the West, when they think of Islam Muslim, they only think of the Arab world. Actually, um, you know, most Muslims live in Asia. Yeah, 60% of Muslims live in Asia, while only about 20% live in the MENA region. Um, you know, and, and the country with the biggest Muslim population in the world is Indonesia, Malaysia's neighbor. I'm located in Malaysia, yeah, with 225 million Muslims. And this is followed by three other Asian countries, Pakistan, India, where the Muslim is a minority, but a huge minority, and Bangladesh. Um, you know, different re religions, ethnic groups, cultures, and traditions flourish in this part of the world. And thus, the Islam that develop in this part of the world is necessarily diverse in terms of understandings and practices, yeah? So legal pluralism thrives in many of these countries until today. Customary, we have customary laws that govern the indigenous, indigenous groups, Muslim laws governing the personal status of Muslims, and civil laws applying to non-Muslims. What makes the situation outrageous in such plural legal systems you know, for women's rights um, activists in the region is that while civil law that govern non-Muslim women have moved forward to recognize equality and non-discrimination, Muslim family laws in the name of Islam remain discriminatory. So you see in countries with plural legal systems like Malaysia, Singapore, Sri Lanka, India, civil laws governing marriage and divorce recognize equality between women and men, but not Muslim family law. In the name of Islam, one segment of the population, and in the, in the context of Malaysia, remains discriminated against. This is really, um, you know, I, I want to share with you the example of Malaysia, where 60% of the population is Muslim. The civil family law, which governs some 40% of the non-Muslim population, was reformed in the 1970s. 50 years ago to recognize equality between women and men. Polygamy was banned. Polygamy is not the invention of Islam. Yeah? The Chinese and the Indian communities practice polygamy as well. Yeah? Polygamy was banned in, in the 1970s. Equal right to divorce was introduced. Further reform in the 1990s gave women equal right to guardianship of their children and also recognized equal right to inheritance. However, these trends, trends in law reform for Muslim women, instead of moving forward like non, for non-Muslim women to recognize equality and non-discrimination reversed, to chisel away at the rights women had gained in the 1980s. 
And this is really largely because of the rise of political Islam, of conservatism throughout the Muslim world that saw many reversals of the gains women had made in all parts of the Muslim world. In Malaysia, two rounds of amendments in the 1990s and the early 2000s made divorce and polygamy easier for Muslim men. The restrictions introduced in the 1980s were deemed, suddenly deemed un-Islamic. And men today could divorce their wives or take another wife without the permission of the court and without prior knowledge of their existing wife. The Insurance Act was amended to enable the deceased insurance benefits to be distributed, distributed according to Fara'id, the Islamic um, method of distribution. This means sons will get a bigger share than the wife and the daughters, even though this might go against the wishes of the deceased. A fatwa was issued as well for distribution of savings under the employee's provident funds according to Fara'id, even though the employee might have named his or her rightful beneficiaries and listed their shares. All that can be negated if it's challenged and it can be divided according to Fara'id. Shares, which again benefit men. So we have a situation in Malaysia where non-Muslim women, in the name of progress, justice and fairness, get to enjoy equal rights with men, while in the name of Islam, the areas of discrimination against Muslim women were expanded even further. This reality should be unconstitutional as it violates the fundamental liberties of all citizens to be treated as equal before the law, so the constitution says. But thanks to British colonial rule, and here I'm answering your question, um, Salome, about uh, the, uh, colonial heritage yeah, in this part of the world, the equality provision in the constitutions of many countries in the region, that includes India as well, exempts personal status laws from this fundamental right to equality. So while the British took over the administration of our countries and promulgated various laws to govern the public life of the colonized subjects, they allowed traditional rulers to maintain control over religion, culture, and tradition. So this makes reform of family law very di difficult because religion was relegated to govern that realm of personal law. So subsequent efforts to reform these laws are often portrayed as threats to group identity and rights, threats to religion and culture, thus making it very, very difficult for us to build public support and generate the political will for change. Another example in Sri Lanka, Muslim women have been trying to reform the Discriminatory Muslim Marriage and Divorce Act for decades. Because of identity politics and a constitutional provision that recognizes all written and unwritten law that existed prior to the 1978 constitution as valid and operative, a family law that is almost 70 years old remains intact until today. The fact that these family laws are largely based on a patriarchal understanding of Islam that discriminates against women in many ways makes it convenient for those opposed to change to attack women's rights groups pushing for reform towards equality and justice as being anti-God, anti-Islam, anti-Sharia. And yet in reality, we see differences and diversity in Muslim family laws in the re region and globally. If it is one divine law based on one divine truth, why the diversity and differences? Within Muslim communities in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, which follow the Hanafi school of Islamic law, a woman can marry without a wali, without a male guardian's permission. But not in Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka, which follow the Shafi'i school of law. In Indonesia, a man needs the authorization of the court and the agreement of his existing wife to enter a polygamous marriage. But in Malaysia and Brunei, the marriage can be validated even if done outside the court without the knowledge, let alone the agreement of his existing wife. And yet, all these countries follow the same Shafi'i school tradition. It is so obvious that we're not talking about one divine law that is eternal and cannot be changed. Really, the issue is the lack of political will 
and courage to push for reform towards equality and justice. And it is really convenient then to use religion to silence and delegitimize the voices calling for reform. And yet, we all know that reform has taken place throughout history. A key area of Muslim family law in which the Southeast Asian region leads by example is on the issue of matrimonial assets. In Malaysia, Indonesia, Brunei, and Singapore, women are entitled to a share of the matrimonial assets upon divorce, even if she has not financially contributed to the acquisition um, of the assets. Her role very progressively, her role as wife and mother is recognized as contribution that enable the husband to acquire those assets that are now in his name. So therefore, she can have a share of that upon divorce or death. However, in Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and in fact, in much of the Muslim world, the concept of shared matrimonial assets simply does not exist. So this, where did this progressive Muslim family law provision come from? It really comes from Urf, from custom, yeah, which is a valid source of law in Islamic legal theory. In the Minangkabau matri matrimonial tradition, ancestral land and property can only be passed on by mothers to their daughters and granddaughters. However, the men in the tribe in the family still have a right of usage of the property and a share of the harvest of the land. This led to the development of the concept of jointly owned marital property, where property acquired or developed through the joint efforts of the married couple can be claimed by either party upon divorce or widowhood. It is interesting to note actually that British judges during the colonial period were very, very surprised at this practice at a time when British law ruled that a man had total control of his wife's property. It was only in 1870 when the Married Women's Property Act was introduced in Britain that married women had control over their own property. And it was the Qadis, the Muslim judges in Malaysia, who were called to the civil court to help the British judges settle property disputes by supporting the wife's right to property and her share of the marital assets. This is a tradition that we should, put, we should be proud of and expand further in terms of recognizing um, you know, rights and, and justice. There have also been risen, risen wins in family law reform coming from the Asian region. More recently, India banned the triple talaq form of divorce. And Indonesia raised the minimum age of marriage for girls to 19, the same as boys. You know, we're, and we're really so proud that the activists in India and um, Indonesia have been actively engaged with Musawa all these past years. So what I want to point out here really is the incredible diversity that exists within the Muslim legal tradition that enables change to take place. The incredible legal tools and concepts of differences of opinion, of public interest, um, you know, of, of choosing the best among many um, 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 different opinions, you know, to, to enable, to make sure that justice and equality become the objective of Islamic law. And this change has been taking place throughout Muslim history in different contexts and periods. So why this loud proclamation by conservative groups and governments that Muslim family law is divine law that cannot be changed or even challenged? If justice indeed is the objective of Islamic law, why can there not be justice for Muslim women? That is the question we are asking. Why is there so much support for the intolerant, conservative, misogynistic viewpoints as if that is the one and only true understanding of Islam? The truth is, this attack against women's right to equality and justice in the end is about politics, about power, about privilege, authority. For us, women's rights activists, this battle is about justice but how the laws that govern us today must reflect the changing realities of our lives to ensure that justice prevails. But those who have held power, privilege, and authority for so long, of course, feel threatened by the realities before their eyes and conveniently abuse religion to silence dissenting voices and the demands for change. 
It is for this reason that in countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Sri Lanka, India, groups led by Muslim women are at the forefront of the public space to break this hegemony of those who hold traditional authority on matters of religion. And what is unique about this activism is that Muslim women are themselves taking the bull by the horn in challenging traditional male authority, building their knowledge on Islam and women's rights, carving their own space and asserting their authority to speak on religion and rights. We believe that in countries where Islam is used as a source of law and public policy and daily practice, all of us who are affected by the ways Islam is interpreted, codified into law, and used to govern our lives, we all have the right to engage with the religion and shape its understanding and use as it is our daily lives and well-being that are affected. We are standing up, speaking out, and declaring enough is enough. In the 21st century, there cannot be justice without equality. It is as simple as that. The time is now for change. Thank you, Salome. Thank you so much, Zaina. That was incredibly fascinating. And again, so inspiring. Thank you for what you're doing. Let us now move to the MENA region and turn to Marwa Sharafeldin. Marwa, hi, thank you for being here. Thank you. So can you please speak about the main issues that women face under Muslim family laws in the region? and how women are mobilizing for reform in the MENA region. And if you could also tell us more about the challenges that women face in advocating for legal reform and equality under the law, that would be wonderful. Sure, thank you. Thank you, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I want to say that Muslim family law reform has always really been a priority in the long history of women's struggles in the Arab region and the Muslim world. I will focus on three family law related issues, especially ones that COVID-19 has really glaringly brought to the fore, not just in the Arab region, but in fact, all over the world, including supposedly developed countries where patriarchy is still alive and kicking. And that I think would propel us towards having an equal solidarity between all of us. Um, Anyway, these, these three issues, which I'm sure all of you will relate to, are domestic violence, women's paid labor, and unpaid domestic and care work. They're valid in every context today in the world after COVID-19. I mean, they're relevant. So we have seen the alarming spike in domestic violence all over the world, and the Arab region, of course, where in some countries, calls to helplines have increased by 100% during the pandemic. We're seeing the increase in beatings, killings, sexual violence, suicide, child marriage, and all the rest of that ugly image. To give a bit of context, the Arab region already has one of the highest rates of intimate partner violence against women worldwide at 37% prevalence. Now let's look at the cost. The cost of domestic violence in social, psychological, and economic terms in some countries reaches more than double what most governments spend on education. In Egypt, for example, it's estimated at 2% of GDP. Now, these are pretty serious figures, yeah, affecting not just women, but the entire society. So what has that got to do with Muslim family law? Well, um, research has shown us that there is a strong link between gender inequality and domestic violence. This inequality skews power relations and when you end up legitimating it in the law itself through male guardianship, male control, male authority over women, there is no escape from having to reform family and penal laws that do that in order to combat violence against women. When you look at many of our Arab and Muslim family laws, they not only contain provisions that promote an unequal relationship between the genders, as we've heard already from Zaina, but they also condone varying levels of violence. So for example, some of these laws still allow differing degrees of wife disciplining, which is really beating by the husband. They allow child marriage and mitigation of penalties on so-called honor killings. 
none of these laws criminalize marital rape. The only exception has been Singapore, and that has been only this year. Some still exonerate the rapist upon his marriage to the survivor, which incidentally came to us through British and French colonialism. These laws make it much easier for men to divorce than women and require wives' obedience to their husbands, giving male guardians the right to restrict the movement of women and girls, their access to education, work, legal services, signing of contracts, and the list goes on. Now, when the guardian who controls women's lives and movements like this in the name of guardianship and protection is himself the abuser, as is often the case, how can we expect women to be able to report, escape, and seek help from domestic violence? It is sardonic that in some countries, women require the permission of a male guardian to exit a domestic abuse shelter. Also, when we look at the definition of violence against women in the UN's 1993 Declaration on the Elimination of Violence Against Women, we find that it exactly applies to these kinds of provisions found in our Arab family laws today. And so there is a relationship between our current family laws and normalizing violence against women in our societies. The cost of these laws therefore become quite high, not just for women, but also their families and even the economy for those who are interested about the economy. So really, what are we waiting for to reform? Now, the other issue that I want to speak with you about, which COVID-19 has also shown us the urgency of, is women's domestic and care labor at home. Many of the Arab region's family laws and practices assume that it is the role of women to perform unpaid domestic and care work. Now, listen to this. Interestingly, this contradicts settled classical Islamic jurisprudence, which does not obligate the wife with this kind of work and requires compensating her if she does. Yes, you did hear me correctly. Islamic law does not oblige the wife with any housework or childcare even. And if she does any of this, she's entitled to be paid for it. There's not much time now to go into the nuances of this, but it's interesting here to see what states pick and choose from Islamic jurisprudence and what they decide to leave out in family laws and practices. This is a political choice. It's not a religious one. It also involves economic power, a particular distribution of wealth, and an exploitation of free labor to the benefit of certain groups. The Muslim family law is a very interesting site where political and economic interests are played out. Reforming it means shifting a very delicate balance of power between all parties involved, including the state, religious authorities, economic elites, and even the international war machine, which sometimes uses these family laws to justify wars against other nations. But back to unpaid domestic labor, now listen to these numbers. The Arab region has the highest rate of unpaid domestic word work for women compared to men in the whole world, where women spend five times more time on unpaid domestic and care work than men. And in many Arab countries, women work more hours than men in the 24 hours of the day. This is in terms of time. Now, what about the actual economic value of all that time spent in domestic work? No accurate figures for the Arab region as a whole yet exist, but the latest figures from Egypt indicate that unpaid domestic work for women has an economic value of up to 30% of GDP. The enormity of this figure is consistent with global figures, where globally unpaid domestic work amounts to 9% or $11 trillion of global GDP. So it's, it's really mind boggling how our family laws conveniently ignore the economic value of this domestic and care labor that women are doing. It is this economic worth of a woman's domestic work that is her way of spending on her family, even if it's not in direct monetary terms. So she's not really taking money out of the wallet, yeah, and paying the laundry, man. She's herself doing the laundry and saving that money for the entire family. And so this puts her at least on an equal footing with the man in terms of financially maintaining the family. Now this has important implications because male jurists who constructed Muslim family rulings 
they did so in a way that gave men superior rights and privileges due to their role in spending on the family. By this logic then, if women choose, remember it's a choice, it's not an obligation, if women choose to do domestic and care labor at home, then that should give them equal rights in the law as men, since they also spend on the family through their own unpaid domestic and care work. Not to mention that just by virtue of women being equal citizens, they should be enjoying equal rights anyway. So the three main issues around domestic and care labor that I want to leave you with is that the number one, this labor should not be assumed to be an obligation on women and our laws and practices. Rather, it's a choice for them as per Islamic jurisprudence. Number two, it should be seen as having economic value that translates into benefits such as health care, social security, pension, but it should also be translated into equal family legal rights, such as the cancellation of wifely obedience, a woman's full guardianship over children, her freedom to move, work, and travel without the husband's permission. Being, uh, beside the woman being an equal citizen who has the right to all this anyway, a woman's economic co contribution to her household through her domestic labor is an added reason above that. And number three, more importantly, it should be seen for the truly important and life-giving labor that it is. It should not be seen only as drudgery to be borne by women, but as a labor of care to be shared by all family members, including men, which Prophet Muhammad himself has given us the example of in his day-to-day -day life. Moving to the third related issue, which is women's paid labor. Now, research shows us that there is a very close relationship between a woman's ability to work outside of the home for pay and the unpaid domestic and care work she has to do. The more she has to do at home for free, the less she's able to do outside the home for pay. And so the result is an abysmally low employment rate of women in the Arab world. Studies show that if women's participation rates in the workforce increase to an equal level with males here, it would lead to a significant increase in GDP for the whole Arab region by a whopping 85%. The loss of this potential is part of the high financial cost of these laws in millions and trillions. All of this is not to say that women should be forced to work to serve a neoliberal agenda rather than choose to take on domestic responsibilities, which by the way, if these domestic responsibilities are done in unpaid form, they, they would still be subsidizing economies at the expense of women. Instead, it indicates that family laws and practices in the region must change to provide women with a truly free choice and adequate compensation regarding their labor, which was already in sync with Islamic jurisprudence. Men are also affected by all this. Despite the privileges that Muslim family law gives them, we know from recent surveys that many Arab men feel pressure and stress about legally and socially having to be the main breadwinner of the family. Oftentimes this leads to their ill health, a rise in cases of depression, and little time spent with their children affecting the quality of that relationship. So I have tried in this first part to show the costs and losses of not reforming these um, uh, laws in the Arab region, not just for the women, but for societies as a whole. The extent of these numbers and the suffering they reflect demonstrate that reform of such laws should be a collective and urgent priority for all and not just for feminist activists. Now moving to the second question, which is the challenges faced in advocacy activism and how in the region and how we're moving forward. I mean, it's not a secret. The Arab region is quite a volatile area politically where proxy wars are being fought here by different world powers on the ground. This of course has its serious challenges affecting women and families quite acutely, as well as the activists who are trying to do something about it. Now worldwide, we're also witnessing a shrinking of civil society spaces. And we can see it clearly in the Arab region, where we find serious threats to women's human rights defenders. These include assassinations, harassment, imprisonment, freezing of assets, travel bans, etc. To top it all off, work on MFL reform, Muslim family law reform, can be quite sensitive and sometimes dangerous, not only because it touches upon issues of deep faith and religion, but more importantly, as I said earlier, because it interferes with a, convenience, a convenient alliance of sorts, which we often find between religious authorities, states and economic elites, both locally and globally, to preserve a particular balance of power in their favor. This makes the reforms of these laws particularly difficult. 
do check the work of Mala Hatun and her colleagues on this. It's actually quite great what they're trying to do. However, Nothing is impossible in front of women, I'd like to think. So despite these challenges, we still find positive reforms taking place in the different Muslim family laws of the Arab region. And do see the work of Lynn Welshman and do check the Musawa's positive development law table that Zaina also gave you a glimpse of. So how is MFL reform even possible in such a difficult context? I use Werner Mensky's kind and concept of living law to show how. For Mensky, law is a hybrid combination of four different types of law that come together in the shape of a kite. State law, natural or religious law, international law, and social norms. All these four, they interact together in the process of making law. Now I put the women's movement here at the steering base of this kite because oftentimes they hold the string connecting all foreigners, all four corners, trying to delicately balance between the state, religion, society, and international affairs to fly the kite. Seeking an opening, you know, to push through these MFL reforms, and depending, of course, on the opportunities that the socio-political moment allows. For example, let's let's listen to some examples and stories. In Egypt, after years of civil society activism that included working with state representatives, in 2000, the Islamic practice of khula was adopted in the procedural, not the substantive Muslim family law, where a woman now has the right to divorce the husband without his consent and without having to prove and present any reasons, after foregoing, of course, her financial rights. Activists recount how this was nudged by the fact that Egypt was going to Geneva shortly after that for its first CEDAW state party report. And the regime at the time was very keen on showing a progressive achievement and face to the international and aid community. In Morocco, the women's movement kept working for more than 20 years of patient, relentless activism, using both Islamic and international human rights discourses to reform the Muslim family law. Again, the political context, remember, it's always politics, yeah? In 2004, that finally enabled the passage of this law, when a new young king had just come to power and the terrorist bombings in Casablanca the year before spurred the desire to show that Islam has another modern face. In that law, wifely obedience was canceled, polygamy restricted, husband and wife were considered equal partners with a shared responsibility towards the family. And all of this done, all of this was done using religious arguments and justifications. So it's not really Islam that is preventing us from moving forward. Actually, it is part of the way moving to the front. Now in post-colonial Tunisia of 1956, it was important to show the world and former colonial powers that Tunisia was indeed capable of progress without interference. For example, polygamy was banned based on Quranic interpretations. They banned it based on the Quran, yeah? and the work of the Tunisian Islamic scholar, Ittahar Haddad. Today, in post-revolutionary Tunisia, with the incessant scuffles between the political Islamists and secularists, using the, con the constitution as a site of contestation, a law was proposed to divide inheritance equally between men and women, based on the inconsistency of the current laws with the Tunisian constitution. We find that reforms also happen through other laws and decrees not in the Muslim family law itself. For example, in Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Jordan, <coughs> excuse me, a domestic violence law was passed combating violence against women to various degrees. Sorry. In Morocco, Lebanon and Jordan, penal code articles exonerating rapists from punishment if they marry the survivors of their crime have been successively abolished. The child law in Egypt gave mothers educational guardianship over their children and provided guidance on the minimum age of marriage. In Palestine, banks no longer require a, a, a male guardian's consent for women to open a bank account for their children. The examples are really, they're numerous, and so are the approaches to go about the reform. In all the above, we find a combination of factors coming together to make the reform happen, such as a persistent woman's movement pushing the issues, a high profile case or incident, a political moment, sympathetic allies within or outside the state, a significant event related to international affairs, and importantly, knowledge that has been developing from within the Islamic framework 
that addresses the needs of lived reality, citizenship, gender equality, and justice. Finally, even though in this region, it is usually the state that seems to be the source of Muslim family law reform, but both research and practice is showing us that more than anything else, it is women's groups organizing that has really led to most of these reforms. They raise the issues, build the knowledge, mobilize alliances, pressure lawmakers, bravely face the demonization and death threats, appeal to humanity and divinity, and lead the way to change. Kudos to them and to all of you who are involved in this kind of change wherever you are. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Marwa. Once again, that was so inspiring and it was such an insightful overview of the situation in the MENA region. So thank you so much for your intervention. Our next speaker is Hala Al-Karib. We're gonna be moving to the greater Horn of Africa with Hala. Let me see. If she... Hi, Hala. Thank you for being here. So to you, I wanted to ask if you could please share your observation of Muslim, Muslim family laws in the region and the main issues Muslim women face in the interaction of MFLs with other customary laws and practices in the region. Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. And um, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, and thank you to uh, Harvard Law School uh, for enabling me to talk about um, something that we, it's part of our day-to-day -day work and uh, activism. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about um, family laws um, um, in um, um, Eastern and Horn of Africa region, where um, the network and the organization I work for, SIHA, is uh, engaged with. Uh, so specifically, I will address family law in um, situation with family law in Sudan, um, in Somalia, Uganda, and uh, um, Djibouti and Ethiopia. Um, the notions of uh, cultural relativism, um, um, specifically and particularly um, in, the, in the greater Horn of Africa, you know, has um, uh, created, and, uh, created and contributed to a reluctancy among um, um, African governments and, and uh, uh, political parties uh, to interrogate and engage with uh, uh, concepts of reforming uh, family law. And um, that's very unfortunate when cultural relativism and cultural specificity become a reason you know, to uh, uh, deny justice and equality for over half of the populations. Um, across the region, the plural legal system are the major barriers in, in, in many countries. And so um, um, negotiating uh, with a patriarchal religious leader has drilled progress in women's rights, access to justice in many parts of the, of the, of the region. Um, I'm going to start, um, or, or actually before I start with, uh, um, uh, with, my, with my country, um, um, Sudan, where I am at at the moment, um, there is uh, something I would like to highlight that a reality cut um, across this region that most of the, uh, uh, those who are in control or, or who are holding power, um, as Marwa said, they are particularly unwilling to allow more equitable uh, family law courts uh, because this would reduce, of course, and take away um, um, their privileges and, and advantages. And this is actually one of, the reason, one of the reasons as women rights activists and people who work on the grounds on daily basis with women, we find, you know, um, and, and we are confronted with that reforming family law is much, much more difficult um, than um, 
uh, to achieve than other agenda, for example, um, such as uh, uh, quotas or enabling women in um, uh, top level positions or, or, or women representation or introducing laws that address uh, female genital mutilations because reforming family law is about, you know, um, um, unpacking and reconstructing the overall um, structure. Um, um, so, um, despite the fact that, and I really, um, um, you know, when I saw the, uh, the fantastic pictures that Marwa has ended her presentation with for Allah Salah, um, the Sudanese activist, which represents, um, you know, the massive participation of Sudanese women in the Sudan revolutions um, in 2019, 2020, um, the transitional government of Sudan that came on the shoulders and based on the hard work of, of women is still extremely reluctant, you know, to reform um, the oppressive uh, laws that targets and criminalize women and girls, uh, particularly addressing the Sudan personal status law, which is, in my view, it's co considered one of the worst family laws in the world. It's a law that enables child marriage. Um, it's a law that enforces uh, guardianship. Um, I mean, um, just um, this morning, we are dealing with um, a strategic litigation case of uh, a woman, um, um, she's accused of adultery, because um, she uh, married um, uh, someone without the permission of her family. And uh, both she and her husband are um, uh, actually in process of being um, jailed and per persecuted for taking control of their lives. Um, so um, the issue of guardianship is, is still valid in Sudan despite, um, and, and it, it interferes and interacts with women, with every aspect of women's life, including, you know, women's health, access to education, access to training, access to employment, and so on. It also absolutely controls women's mobility and where she should go, and so on. Um, um, Sudan is definitely enabling, under the current personal status law, uh, is enabling marital rape. Bologomy is uh, absolutely legitimized um, and, and, and so on. Um, also, Sudan is one of um, two countries in sub-Saharan Africa, Sudan and Somalia, uh, who are actually not signatory um, to CEDU or any of the women's rights um, uh, protocol and conventions. Um, now I'm going to speak about another country, um, uh, Ethiopia, which is um, a champion the diversity um, um, uh, within family law and um, in reconciling between the um, international um, human rights mechanisms and um, the uh, cultural and traditions of the country. Um, so, um, since uh, the revision of the family code in Ethiopia in the year 2000 and the penal code in 2004, um, um, legal protections uh, um, and, and human rights of women has significantly increased. Um, the revised family code of the fe federal government applies, and, and this is the catch, you know, because the revised family code of the federal government applies only in the administration that are directly accountable to the federal government. So Ethiopia is an excellent example of a plural legal system and how actually um, uh, governments um, in this part of the world um, could in a way, you know, uh, while appear and look to be uh, committed to the, um, you know, to, um, um, to endorsing um, their international and legal uh, commitments, but at the same time um, to find ways through uh, the plural legal system um, to enable um, a very, very clear discriminations um, against women. So Ethiopia has signed and ratified CEDU in 1994. Uh, however, 
um, uh, the catch is, uh, is approximately, and let's just say approximately, there is one third of the, of the Ethiopian population are, are Muslims. Um, so, um, and, and uh, uh, what's happening is that Ethiopia is also acknowledging a parallel legal system of um, Islamic Sharia. So women are often put in, um, 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 in a position where they should either choose between pursuing the statutory system, which is they could receive justice through it, or they go through the um, Sharia courts, which is um, extremely dominated uh, by traditional um, 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 jurisprudence uh, uh, concepts. So, um, so that's always been um, a complicated situation for for the women in Ethiopia, and and um, um, the Ethiopian government is supporting Sharia court all the way uh, to the um, to the high. Um, Sharia court. So, so even um, so, women they don't have, um, according to the law, they cannot shift from from the Islamic law into the. So, the Islamic law is fully institutionalized. It's fully endorsed in certain states of Ethiopia, and they cannot. Uh, women cannot shift into the into the statutory system. And like many areas of the of the Greater Horn of Africa, Salafism and um, is dominating, um, you know, the uh, uh, large part of the religious scholarships in Ethiopia. So the interpretations of um, women's rights uh, within the Sharia court is absolutely uh, very much um, traditional and it's, um, it's unfair. And, and there is one case um, in particularly very famous, um, uh, Ms. Khadija Bashir, who refused to give her consent, um, 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 refused to um, um, to give um, uh, her consent to to the to the Sharia court, you know, because she was um, um, you know deprived from inheritance and so on, you know, and and she was unable you know, to uh, sort of uh, um, um, access the statutory court, although, you know, she continued to struggle for years and years, try to find um, access to, um, uh, to fair inheritance. Um, I'm, I'm from Ethiopia, I'm going to speak a little bit about, uh, about Uganda, which is another champion of, um, or perceived as, as champion in, in women's rights. Um, um, the, marriage, the Ugandan Marriage and Divorce Bill, it's considered, according to Ugandan activists, it's considered one of the most debated laws in the history of Uganda. The bill has been, um, uh, but on the other hand, the bill has been heavily criticized, not only um, uh, by, by Muslim communities who are minority in Uganda, but also by Christian communities, by churches, by trad traditionalists, and, and, and so on. So um, um, in Uganda, the current marriage and divorce law has been in place since 1904. So uh, while Uganda is um, uh, uh, ratified and a member to CEDU and has a very advanced and equitable um, uh, gender policies and, and, and gender framework, when it comes to family law, um, Uganda is still um, um, dictated by, um, uh, or Ugandan women are still dictated by a law that goes back to 1904 and to the um, sort of the decision of, um, of, of the judges and, and, and so on. Sorry, um, I'm, my office is next to the window. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, of course, um, this is also. Um, completely against um, um, the Ugandan constitutions, which provides equality um, to all men and women. However, uh, family law um, in Uganda is still a point of controversy um, where both 
uh, um, you know, uh, communities and, and, and people from different religious backgrounds, particularly those who are in governments, you know, um, they sort of, every time the bill was introduced to the parliament, you know, it was obstructed, unblocked. Um, um, Somalia uh, is also um, is another um, example, um, which is um, um, the, and, and I'm going to specifically speak about the, the experience of um, Somaliland, which is Northern Somalia, um, a semi-independent uh, territory. It doesn't have a codified law. So the vacuum uh, is typically filled um, uh, with a combination of, uh, of Sharia law and, uh, and, and when we say Sharia law, it means, you know, um, 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 Islamic tradition, a law that was based on Islamic traditions and it was subject to the interpretations of um, the judges who were most of the time trained based on um, Salafism um, schools. And um, also it's based on, um, on, on clan on clan laws. So, um, so there is um, a lot of grievances, for example, when it comes to inheritance, it could be um, uh, women could even be like completely deprived of inheritance um, uh, based on the judgments of the um, of the of the sheikhs who are controlling um, the family law. Now, uh, the family law courts. Um, South Sudan is, um, and, and I really decided to speak about South Sudan here because it's, um, it's a very, um, um, you know, it's definitely a, a country that's worth looking at. You know, it's, a, it's the youngest country in Africa. It's a, it's a country that's adopting a plural um, um, legal system, South Sudan has ratified CEDU and all the protocols that endorses women's rights. Uh, but at the same time, um, South Sudan is, um, um, you know, uh, very much um, adopting uh, a plural legal system where all family matters are pushed to, um, to the customary court. So women in South Sudan are still um, um, subject to the uh, the whole issue of the uh, bride wells, you know, um, um, women who were asking for divorce, for example, are um, expected to provide to repay um, the bride wealth back to the to the clans of the uh, of the husband. Those uh, in many parts of South Sudan, um, those women who are not actually responding to that. Uh, they are subject to um, a lengthy imprisonment and with no access to any legal aid or support. Wife inheritance is quite prevalent in South Sudan, uh, which is um, a woman who lost her husband um, because of the resources and the exchange that happens during the marriage. She is not free and she is bound to stay within the husband clans and then they impose um, um, you know, um, um, a, a man from the family on her. I have seen cases where women committed suicide, you know, um, due to this situation of, you know, repeated sexual violence. And I remember one time I witnessed um, a, a traditional court in South Sudan um, and um, um, the, the main reason of the court that the woman had left, you know, uh, the wife and the husband, they were sharing a bed. She left the bed and she decided to sleep on the floor next to the husband. So the husband interpreted that as an act of abandonment. And then they hold the traditional court. This was one of the most painful things, you know, seeing um, the negotiation between the family um, um, of the of the wife and the family of the husband wanting to send the woman back, and then after I remember we were sitting from eleven until six o'clock, and the bargaining was the family of the wife should pay the husband family two cows so that he can accept to take the wife um, again. 
So um, um, it's, it's, it's really, and, and, and as I said, South Sudan is a signatory to CEDU. It's, uh, um, um, and, and uh, but there is, uh, South Sudan is still to have, um, you know, um, a personal status or a family law in line with international mechanism. However, um, um, the, in most of the countries that we are working in, as SIHA, um, 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 my organizations, uh, uh, one of the um, uh, most significant um, issues that we need to pay attention to, that people, communities, and, and they, um, the way they approach family law, they approach family law as a, a construct of, of their identity. And, and, and I remember when I was um, um, in South Sudan um, and, and we were talking about issues of family law and the impact of the plural legal system on women rights. And, and you know, what we, what, we, what we used to get is like, why don't you go and build a school or do something useful rather than talking about family law. This is our culture. This is our heritage. The same thing we are encountering here in Sudan, the same thing in Somalia. People, they perceive, you know, um, the notions of injustice, discriminations, particularly in this part of the law, as part of their identities. And this is um, um, absolutely being used and abused by uh, politicians who use religion, who use traditions to interrogate um, uh, communities who doesn't have access um, to, um, to alternative um, informations. Um, I'd just like to end um, my presentation on a positive note that um, there is definitely a growing um, um, level of awareness um, in this part of the world and, and uh, um, women activism and their voices are definitely um, um, are becoming much more um, assertive in terms of rejecting the notion of injustice in, in the family law and in making the connection between family law, uh, political participation, access to decision making, poverty, which is all concentrated in the family law that's actually halt um, uh, women, uh, women back and, and, and obstructing um, their progress and equality. Thank you. Thank you, Hala. It's good to, to hear that positive note you ended on. Thank you so much. There's so much to talk about and there's a lot of questions that are coming from our participants. So I'm going to go ahead and move to the Q&A. Um, let's try to make the most of it. So I'll be going through a few rounds of questions and calling on, on speakers to respond, if that sounds good. I think the best would be to start with a general question. And this one is for Zaina and Marwa. So I'm, I'm gonna tell you two questions that kind of seem to go together and, and then get your thoughts on those. So the first one is, what is Musawa's view of Islamic inheritance law, which is in the Quran? Are you seeking to reinterpret those? And then they ask, what is Musawa's view on incorporating in the family law, the principle of joint matrimonial property within the contract of marriage, similar to the Moroccan family law? So I don't know if Zaina, you wanna start answering that question? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we specifically have not worked on in inheritance law, but certainly the, the knowledge building that we have been doing on equality, on justice, on the possibility of reform, necessity of reform towards equality and justice, that knowledge, that approach with Dirk can certainly can be used, um, you know, to support yeah, reform of inheritance law to recognize justice, to recognize um, equality. In fact, you know, um, Tunisia is already on that path um, of reform and there is a lot of research that's already being done um, on inheritance law. One of the resource persons that we use, um, Zahia um, Joaru, is has already done a lot of research on the possibility yeah, of reform of um, inheritance law. So different interpretations, different understandings have already come out to justify it is possible to reform the inheritance laws that have been 
that have discriminated against women. So it can be done. Um, and you see Morocco as well. Debate has begun in Morocco. In Tunisia, the government has taken the initiative um, to reform those laws. Of course, it's like it's going to be tremendously difficult because it's about money and property and men who are privileged with money and property, um, you know, are going to fight tooth and nail and say that this is against Islam because it's so specific in the Quran, you know, but really those privileges men have a link to responsibility. If they don't provide, they don't care, they, you know, for their children, for their wives, for their, the women folk in the family, why should they continue to be? Um, privilege in getting double the share of inheritance. So if any provision, I mean, for us, you know, and for me personally, you know, I mean, if a law, if Islamic law causes injustice, causes harm, causes discrimination, and certainly the discrimination against women in the inheritance laws do that, you know, women, women are the ones who are taking care of their parents until they die. And yet when their parents die, it's the brother who's going to get double the share. And this is just so unfair. Um, quickly, and the other point about um, uh, matrimonial assets. Yes, definitely. That is something that we are pushing for. Um, we are recommending. Um, and in fact, in the campaign for Muslim family law um, that um, we, you know, that we have launched, this is one of the areas of law reform um, where there is a lot of interest from the women's groups um, that we are working on, um, I, you know, that, that we're working with, they want us to work on division of matrimonial, women's right to division of matrimonial assets. So certainly, you know, we, we, we've de we're developing a policy brief on this to make all the arguments for why it is possible for women to have a share of the matrimonial assets, the arguments in Islam, the arguments in live realities, um, human rights arguments. So definitely that is something that we're pushing on and that's something that we're going to build on um, as part of the campaign and really build a, a collective and a, folk, a, a thematic group on the whole issue of pushing forward on matrimony, including matrimonial assets in Muslim family laws as part of the reform process. Wonderful. And Marwa, do you have any thoughts about, about that? Yes, definitely. And I'm going to focus on inheritance. Now, we are, are we seeking to reinterpret? I think what we do more in Musawa is to deconstruct how the knowledge we have today about Islam came to be, yeah? We're being told this is divine. You can't touch it. Inheritance, the rules are very clear. The numbers are very clear. Yet, it hasn't always been the case. So we deconstruct this knowledge. We go back to the text. We go back to legal history. And we try and reconstruct a new knowledge that addresses the issue of equality and justice, which is what the Quran is all about, which is what Islam, which is actually what all religions are all about, equality and justice. Now, it's not just us, by the way. You have scholars around the world who have uh, started to produce new knowledge that's not really new about the equality, how inheritance should be distributed equally between women and men. Sheikh uh, Shahroor, uh, Dr. Zahia Jwiru, and you know, I'm not gonna list the names, a lot of them. But before that, you have Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second uh, Sunni caliph. We have two very famous cases of Umar ibn al-Khattab where he actually went against the text. He did not follow the text because in his context, if he had followed the text, he would have done an injustice. Yeah? That is not to say that the text is unjust. No, it is to say that the text did not cover all possible situations of families who have people dying in them. Yeah, it gave you principles. And just go Google and Mas'ala al umariya There are two Mas'ala al umariya the, the Umar case, and you'll, you'll find out what I'm saying. And also, let's remember that the Quran is a book of guidance, yeah, more than it is a book of law. The, the law uh, verses in the Quran are what, 6%? Yeah, but the rest of it is ethics, guidance. And what it has done is it, it has given us a trajectory, a path to move along. So what we have in the Quran is the start of that path towards equality and justice. Yeah, slavery, for example. In the Quran, slavery was not banned. It was completely impossible to ban slavery at the time. The whole economic structure was based on that kind of free labor at the time of revelation. But what did the Quran do? It gave us a trajectory towards freeing those slaves. Yeah, 
You do something bad, free a slave. You want something done, free a slave. What is it telling us? It's telling us that slavery is not good. Move towards freeing slaves. And that's our responsibility today to actually realize that trajectory. The same thing with inheritance. By the way, in, there are several, plenty of cases where women inherit equally as men according to the Quran. By the way, you know, those who come to you and scare you and tell you you're going against the Quran, <laughs> it's already there. But what has happened is that jurists across the ages, because it's a money issue, like Zaina was saying, they took one verse and they made it the rule, which is males inherit double the females. And that was for a certain case, and they made it the, the, the bigger principle, overarching principle. Um, now, we have, as I said, cases where women and men uh, inherit equally. Um, Musawa's position. Now, we, I don't like this thing about Musawa's position because every context has its needs. What we do is we provide options, like the, the positive law table that we talked about. The positive law table shows us a menu of options of how to deal with inheritance in a way that achieves equality and justice today in today's world. Look at Tunisia, for example. What they did was they gave citizens two options. You either follow the option where men inherit more than women, or you have a choice to follow another way that is also allowed by Islam where you can inherit equally. So no one is being coerced. What is the problem? Why are you upset? You know, you can choose which way. So there's this colorful menu of options that we can choose from. And it's very important for us to understand because inheritance is a very sensitive subject. There is a difference between Sharia, ah, which is the divine message that doesn't change with time or place, and fiqh. Fiqh is jurisprudence. It's human understanding. And human understanding, of course, it differs, yeah? It differs by time, by place. So every context will be able to produce its own solutions. Um, and I, let me just end on this, that the Quran through its inheritance uh, rulings was trying to move us towards justice. And justice is a very important issue in Islamic jurisprudence. Today, in today's world, if we are going to say that Islam is still valid, as we always say, Islam is valid for all time and all places, we have to recognize that today, justice must include equality. And yeah, that's the bit about inheritance. Uh, with, with matrimonial assets, we have several options. It's not just the Moroccan experience, but I'll, I'll end it here. Thank you, Marwa. This is a question that was directly posed to Hala. So it says, if there are ongoing customary practices, is codification of family laws in countries where it is currently not codified a good thing or a bad thing? And do options in choosing family law regimes work in greater Horn of Africa countries? Do women actually get to choose in practice? Well, thank you very much. I mean, I, I'll, I'll start with the concept of justice that Marwa ended with, you know, which is, um, it's, a, it's, it's more and more becoming, you know, a very uh, clear, you know, concept that women are seeking across the greater horn of Africa. I mean, the presumptions that women are actually, um, um, you know, um, accepting of um, notion of injustice um, and, and deprivation of equality because they see that as part of their culture. Uh, I mean, that is not there um, and, and, and it's not real. You know, this is um, in, in our view as activists and it's, you know, work very intimately and we are an extension of those women, myself and my colleagues as well, in where we are. We um, live the injustice, you know, that was uh, uh, actually enforced under the pretext of religion and culture and on, on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, we see the polarizations, we see the torture, the criminalization that's happening um, as a result of that. It's very, very critical for um, um, the countries in the greater Horn of Africa to accept 
you know, the necessity to reform um, and, and to codify, you know, a, a family law that's based on justice and equality. And, and this is not only, um, um, you know, um, because as, as I said, you know, family law is not about, it's, it's not a private, it's something that has its extension, manifestation and reflection in every aspect of the society um, that we're living in. We cannot talk about issues of women, peace and security when women are brutalized and jailed, you know, because of um, dowry system and bride wealth. We cannot talk about women political participation and access to decision making when uh, women are uh, criminalized for, uh, for just being women, for, the, for their dress code, for their willingness to work, for their ability to marry the person they want to marry, and, and so on. So it's, very, it's a matter of, um, you know, of society's stability. It's a matter of humanizing um, our, uh, our society. And, uh, you know, and, and also it's a matter of, as we, no one has, um, um, as, as, as it's, it's, it's jurisprudence, it's, um, it's ishtihad, it's efforts of juries that was made. And we, we as women are very capable of identifying our own path, you know, to justice and equality within our own religion and culture. So uh, we shouldn't be put in, in that positions um, uh, at start. Yeah, I, ho I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you so much. Okay, now a question about challenges that you face on the ground. So this is for all of you. What challenges do you anticipate from orthodox elements within majority Muslim countries to family law reform? Are there any religious scholars lending support to reform in, for example, inheritance laws? And what is the role that Muslim politicians have played so far? Is there anyone who wants to take that on? Zain, I think your, your mic is off. I was there we go. Oh, it's back off. <laughs> it was on for a second. Zaino, I can't I can't hear you. I think the mic is off again. Yeah, sorry. Okay. There, um, um yeah. Those are the challenges we've been facing for decades, <laughs> um, you know, from, from male politicians, from male clerics, um, you know, and, um, and um, but, you know, I mean, this is why, like, you know, in the context of Malaysia, you know, Sisters in Islam was established 30 years ago, 30 years ago before Islam became fashionable, um, you know, in, in the world, you know, that we realized the challenges we were facing, you know, in terms of the opposition to the kinds of change that we want. Um, and that we felt that it was just extreme. We, you know, you can't wait for change to be served to you on a silver platter. You can't wait for the traditional conservative religious authorities to change and to believe in equality and justice before you can change um, um, the laws and change this under discriminatory understandings of Islam. You can't wait for the men in power to be ready for change. So that's why the, 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 the strategy that we took in Malaysia is if we want change, if we women want to change, we have to create that change. We have to build that change. We have to assert our authority to speak on Islam yeah, and break the monopoly that the traditional religious authorities that men have over matters of religion and to really show, you know, that, that this doesn't, if, you know, like I said earlier, if you want to use Islam as a source of law and public policy, we who are affected by those laws and public policy, we have the right 
yeah, to speak out on this. And we need to build allies. So we build allies with religious scholars. We build allies with political leaders, you know, but we need to take that leadership rather than wait for um, the man in power, you know, to, to, to bring about the change, you know. So we need to change the situation on the ground to make it politically costly for them to ignore the voices of women that have emerged, you know, and, and the research has shown that in many countries, reform has taken place, whether it's domestic violence law, whether it's family law, is the women's movement, the women's groups in these countries play a critical role in driving um, the reform forward. So, you know, of course, building, you know, it's important that we have allies, you know, in, in government, in religious authority, and there are, there are a few men who are willing to do that. And in some countries, many, many religious scholars. Indonesia is one country where the religious scholars are incredibly progressive. Male religious scholars are incredibly progressive because of the tradition, the way Islam developed in Indonesia, where they are fully supportive, you know, or many of them are very, very supportive you know of the demands of the of the women's group so so you know i you know I, I i guess the point that i want to make is that you know while it's important to have alliances and to work with we do that we absolutely work with religious scholars because this work cannot be done through activism alone this work has to be done in a combination of activism and scholarship but it is also important to recognize the authority of women and the right of women who are affected by religious laws you know to 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 legitimacy of their with the religion and 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 speaking out and shaping religion is understood, um, how religion is um, interpret, interpreted and how religion is used um, to codify, you know, to, to, to codify into laws and pre uh, into laws that govern our lives. So it is, you know, that authority of the women's voice and the women's experience of living Islam and being impacted by Islamic law, that gives us women the authority to speak out on matters of religion. Thank you, Zaina. So we're a little bit over time. I do want to hear Marwa's thoughts on this as well. So if you could take two minutes to answer that. And then I have one final question for all of you that I'd really like to hear your answer on. I'm sorry, so just to revise, so it, the, the question was about how we're changing Muslim family law again? Oh, actually, Marwa, give me one second. I'm gonna go ahead and <clears throat> ask you a specific question that they had for you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so here's the question. To what extent social movements and NGOs in the Arab societies are capable of influencing the family law process? Can you share some successful examples, any advice for young female Arab scholars who work in the regions hoping to make real impact? Yes, I have tried in the presentation to give some examples, but uh, we're writing a paper with Musawa now about the different approaches that we can take to reform the law. And there are so many approaches. You can do the reform through procedural law. You can do it through reforming other laws, you know, like having a domestic violence law, for example, or reform the penal code or so on. So there are many approaches there. And the thing that has come out consistently, so in my part of the paper, I dealt with five countries, uh, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, anyway, the five countries. And the consistent thing that kept coming out is that it was always the women's movement that spurred the change, even if the state took on the cause later or was pressured into taking the cause later. It was always the women's movement, no matter how restrictive the democratic space was. Yeah. I, so if the person asking that question is worried about the fact that maybe there are countries where you really can't do much, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> it's very tight politically for civil society there will always be something to do. And let us look at the example of Sisters in Islam. Sisters in Islam who have managed to launch a whole global movement called Musawa today, started with a group of eight women, eight friends sitting together, deciding to read the Quran together themselves. Instead of hearing what others are saying about it, they decided to build their knowledge through a study group. That's how Musawa started. So, Again, back to the paper that I'm writing, 
there is always a way. There is always something to be done. Every playing field, every context has a crack in it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, we are trying to work towards justice and equality. So you will find that you will find supporters along the way, you know, and we will find people who hate you as well along the way. That's fine. But no matter how difficult it is, it's, it, there is something to be done. Um, I think I've answered, is there a, the second part of the question? I've answered it as well? I think so. Yeah, I think that was great. Thank you. Thank you. So for the final question, and this is for the three of you, it's a two part question. How do you think women from different parts of the world can be active in supporting the efforts of Muslim women pushing for reform of Muslim family laws? And how can we as international human rights lawyers and advocates contribute positively to your work? Hala, do you Great. wanna start off? Um, yeah, that's, that's wonderful that there's interest in being a part of, um, you know, of, of, of the Musawa movement and being a part of the campaign. In fact, if specifically in terms of the campaign, where we, we have like many, many activities being planned and it's great if you, um, you know, write to us um, at, at Musawa and we'll be in touch because the first major activity we're going to have is the global conference on Muslim family law reform um, at the end of November. So we got to do it online, unfortunately. It was planned as a big global meeting, um, you know, but now um, it's gonna go online. And so it's huge technical challenges for us, but we're really excited about, about, about organizing this. So do write to us. We're going to have regional workshops. So depending on where you are in the regions, we've already had our Asia, um, South Asia and Southeast Asia regional workshop on Muslim family law reform. And early next year, we're gonna plan one um, for, for for, for Sub-Sahara Africa and for the MENA region. So you can join us um, there. Um, and then of course, you know, the follow-up work, you know, this campaign right now, we're designing it as a five-year campaign. We're not gonna get reform next year. So don't, <laughs> don't think it's gonna end fast. So, you know, so there'll be many activities. We're thinking of forming thematic groups. Like I mentioned one thematic group on my asset get across the, on the issue of matrimonial assets in terms of both knowledge and strategy and campaign um, on, on minimum age of marriage or you know on different different issues depending on what the needs are on the ground. Musawa is very very sensitive about not imposing itself um, at the national level. Um, you know we need to work with groups and individual scholars and activists at the national level and really um, you know together you know um, support each other in building this movement at the national level, at the regional level, and at the international level. Thank you. Hello? Thank you very much. Um, so um, basically, uh, one, I think it's very important, um, you know, uh, for you know, for, for other women and, and women rights movement around the world to, to observe, you know, um, our rights, you know, and entitlement for justice and equality. Um, as Muslim women and as women who are Muslim and non-Muslim who live in this part of the world. And um, the other thing that I think it's very, very important, both Marwa and Zain, as they talked about the women movement, and I would really like to stress um, the importance that as women who are living in this part of the world, you know, um, and as part of the women movement, we should also be very clear in our engagements in politics and in politicizing our requests and our demands for justice and equality and not to uh, sort of present it, you know, um, um, as a separate issue, you know, and to observe the intersectionality between personal status laws and, and, and family laws, you know, and, um, you know, um, the overall um, uh, political and economic situations of, of women um, in, in society. Um, so um, I think solidarity should come with um, respect and understanding that we we deserve equality. We are entitled for equality and 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 for justice. Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you. Marwa, do you have any final thoughts about that question? Uh, well, I think it's very important to start with ourselves first, yeah? Before we go out to the world, it's important to build our knowledge, to, to be confident, to have, you know, strong roots in our own tradition. Even if you're secular, yeah, that's fine, you know? Because the law is based on religion, as feminists, we can no longer afford to say we're not going to deal with religion. We've, we've seen where that has taken us today, yeah? So root yourselves in that tradition, know it very well, build your knowledge, and be confident about this knowledge. And um, I think that's where it starts. It starts with each and every one of us. And then I join Zaina, and then I join Hela, and then I join Suri, and then I join Salomi, and then I, and the circle keeps getting wider and wider. And eventually, I'm telling you, we're going to make that change happen. Inshallah. Thank you. Thank and remember, you. how I said we started with just eight women in Malaysia yeah. 30 years ago, and look where we are today. Yeah. yeah. So it's Absolutely. possible. Change is possible. <laughs> Nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. I love that. Thank you. Thank you to everyone. I really want to thank all of our speakers. You're so inspiring and really truly value all of the work that you're doing. Thank you also to our audience for your wonderful engagement and very interesting questions. And of course, to the people behind the scenes who made this webinar possible. As I mentioned at the beginning, the recording will be available in YouTube um, in the coming days and you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter and sign up for our mailing list. The links should be in the chat now. Yep, they're right there. And finally, please stay tuned for another upcoming webinar um, hosted by the Program on Law and Society in the Muslim World. It's going to take place on October 14th at noon Eastern time, and we'll be discussing movement lawyering and LGBTQ advocacy in Lebanon. You can look out for the announcement on um, social media. We'll be sending the Zoom link. So thank you again to everyone. May you stay safe and healthy wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.